Well, welcome everybody to ne- our next uh, podcast here. I've got my good friend Mike Ramp with us. Uh, Mike uh, is a uh, well-known realtor in town. He uh, operates under the brand of Angle and Volkers. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks very much for having me, Andrew. So, Mike, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the real estate market in Vancouver. It's a always a hot topic yep, that people like that to right. listen to. Um, but before we jump into that, uh, let's talk a little bit about yourself. I, I, I hear an accent, so it tells me that you probably weren't originally from Vancouver. No. Nope. Uh, uh, and it doesn't sound like a Vancouver Island accent. I would recognize that one in a heartbeat. So, uh, <laughs> yes. where, where, where'd you come from? Where, where were you born? I was born and raised in South Africa. Okay. I moved here with my family in 1995. Yeah. Uh, pretty much born and raised in Johannesburg. Not okay. one of the uh, safest cities in the world. And that's one of the reasons why we're here. I moved over here with my mom, my dad, and my sister. Okay. Yeah. How old were you when you moved? 15. 15. Yeah. Yeah. I got offered a job actually when I was 18 years old to be a real estate agent okay. um, with the condition of getting a degree. So that took uh, four years, five years. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And uh, when traveling for a year after I graduated and I lived in Australia and moved all over the world, it was fun yeah. surfing and uh, got back to Vancouver in 2004 and have been selling real estate ever since. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. So where did you go to school? So I went to UBC. Okay. Uh, I sought a school of business, got a marketing degree there. Yeah. Uh, the mentor that I worked with told me not to get a real estate degree. Okay. He said, learn how to market and I will teach you real estate. And okay. I'm really glad I went that route. He was an amazing mentor in Vancouver on the West side. Yeah. Um, told me everything I needed to know and, and how to sell properly. So he was a real estate agent. He was a realtor. A- yeah. Is he still a realtor today? No, he's actually retired. Okay. Yeah. He's yeah. retired. Yeah. So uh, Can we call, call out who he is for, for... <laughs> Mike Andraff. Okay. Yeah. 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 And he was yeah. a good mentor for you. Very. very. All right. Well, thanks yeah. Mike Yeah. <laughs> uh, for helping out Mike. Yeah. Thanks Mike. <laughs> so, uh, so I didn't even know you could get a real estate degree. What is that in? Is it Urban land and economics. They okay. basically teach you the fundamentals of commercial and residential and land and... Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. an economics uh, degree then, is that, or is it under business? It's under business. Oh, it's it's under, under Sauter, oh, Sauter okay. School of Business. And yeah. it's, yeah, the title is Urban Land and Economics. Yeah. Sean, my business partner, has his degree and right. his major is Urban Land and Economics. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating. A lot of times I meet people who are really good at their, at their job or their profession. And they often their, their base sort of education is in a completely different field or in a, a not maybe necessarily completely, but in a different field. And I yeah. think that variety actually helps them a lot. Oh yeah, I agree. Yeah, a hundred percent. Because I wasn't so focused on just real estate. I actually learned, and the part of real estate that I really enjoy is the marketing aspect of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the company you're with is called Engel and Volkers. Yes. Uh, it's uh, is that a German? I mean, it is. It Nailed is. It. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I wasn't sure if it was like a classic, like you know, Hagen Dazs. Is, <laughs> people think it's German, but it's actually a, it's actually an American yep. ice cream brand. So I didn't yep. know this is just a really fancy way of making. <laughs> so it's make us sound cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, we're a German company. It's about okay. forty years. We've got nine hundred shops all over the world, from Asia to South Africa to all over Europe. Yeah. Uh, Victoria. Yeah. Uh, there's a bunch on the island. Yeah. Um, all over the states in Canada. It's, yeah. Uh, I was with Remax for about. 12 years. I've been mm-hmm. with Engel and Volkers now for two okay. and uh, really enjoying it. It's a very elite brand that's, and what, what I mean by elite is their marketing standards are uh, just out of this world. They really yeah. are a really high level. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, a really high level. Yeah. Um, their expectation from the company is like something I've never seen before. They're always trying to push us to be better and uh, push the envelope, which is great. Right. Yeah. yeah. Do you know where the name Engel, I mean, I'm assuming it's people, some two fellows' last names. But, it is. And are they still are they still alive? Christian Valkers is still around. Okay. Um, and his friend has unfortunately passed away. Okay. Yeah. So and just it, one owner at the moment. And he's still involved in the business? Oh, yeah. Have you met well, him? Not, no, not yet. No. I, I plan on going to Hamburg and meeting him eventually. Um, he is not necessarily selling, as far yeah. as I'm aware. He's just running his big company. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so let's get into the, 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 the reason why I have you here today, yeah. which is to talk about Vancouver real estate. And one of the things I do want to also talk about is some of the, you know, dispelling some of the myths or misunderstandings of real estate. You know, my, uh, you know, full disclosure, my dad was a realtor for like, I think like 25 years yep. on Vancouver Island. And so I grew up with a father who was a, you know, lived and died by his ability to generate uh, income for the family through real estate sales. So I have a, I have a real, you know, personal and my 
you know, a soft spot in my heart for, for guys like yourself who make, you know, make their venture into this world. Cause it looks from the outside, maybe like you guys all make a ton of money and it's a very glamorous job and maybe even don't have to work that hard. But I, I know you <laughs> and I know my dad and I know a lot of people and it's, that's definitely not the case. So, yeah. um, so but let, before we go and diving into like the world of being a realtor, let's talk a little about the Vancouver real estate market. Um, obviously it's been the press a lot, especially with this whole, sort of uh, belief that maybe there's been a lot of laundered money that's come into the city that's driven up real estate prices. There's a lot of people who th claim that, you know, these overseas buyers have really had an impact. And of course, I, my, my argument is it's hard to really quantify that because there's no data to back that up. And I'm a very data driven kind of person. But I, I just want to maybe start by asking, okay, let's start with the market today. Like we're, we're you know, and near the end of February, 2019, what does the Vancouver real estate market look like today? In one word, slow. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> the look, my my market that I typically work in is what and what I'd like to focus on during this conversation is because it's what I know. I work on the east side and the west side and downtown of okay. Vancouver. That's okay. it. Yeah. Um, what's happening in Burnaby, Coquitlam? Yeah, and North Shore. I, it, I don't yeah. really know. I, yeah. I know North Shore and West Van, um, but they're not areas that I specialize in. Yeah. So. The west side, the east side, downtown, what's going on? I think we've got three different markets here. We've got condos downtown. We've okay. got houses on the west side. We've got condos and townhouses and houses, I suppose, on the east side of Vancouver. Um, we now have a new government, yep. uh, and it was kind of their and, mandate. And when you're talking about new government, you're talking about the city government? Provincial. Or about provincial. Okay. Yep, yeah, provincial. There was their mandate to make real estate more affordable. Yeah. They implemented a number of taxes. They implemented um, a number of policies to bring down the price of real estate yeah. and to make real estate more affordable for locals. Okay. So they Im implemented taxes to stop speculation and vacancy. Uh, I'm sure we're going to get into that in a little bit more detail yeah. soon. Yeah, sure. Um, and the market over the last two years, three years, let's say look back three years, uh, it was trying to keep up with the Joneses. Oh, my friend, my neighbor has an ex investment condo. I need to get in. I need to buy an investment condo. I need to be like everyone else. The typical bandwagon mentality of Vancouver. Yeah. Um, that has subsequently changed. Okay. Uh, people realize that uh, the market will not always increase like no asset can for <laughs> many, many years over and over, as you can tell us all, I'm sure. Um, so the market has slowed down. We've seen a lot more inventory on the market the urgency for a buyer. Why do you have to buy now when you know tomorrow the same house is gonna be worth less money? Is it the mentality now? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's mm -hmm. starting to slow down. And why that's slowing down is because if you had your eye on a house or a condo that you wanted to buy, but you were waiting for that house to drop a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars $200,000, and then you get a call from your realtor saying, oh, by the way, West 15 sold. Like, oh man, I really had my heart set on West 15th. Okay, well now my next option is West 33rd. Yeah. Um, okay, maybe we should go write an offer on West 33rd because I don't want that to go. And then your yeah. realtor calls you back saying they have an accepted offer. So now you're seeing a little bit more urgency coming in. Okay. Our open houses are a little bit busier and yeah. that is condos downtown all the way to the houses that we have listed as well from December and January, we were having no one coming through our open houses. Now yeah. we're getting 12, 15 people through. So we're seeing some more people coming through our open houses, more buyers, active buyers. Yeah. But one of the problems is these active buyers need to sell something in order to buy. So we need someone to buy their listing so they can pull the trigger on the next purchase. So it's yeah. another domino effect that needs to happen in this market. Yeah. So. Well, when we bought our house uh, through, through you guys uh, five years ago now, um, the market was in a period where things can, I was really worried we were buying at the top. Now in hindsight, we, we didn't thankfully. Um, but it was kind of like you had to come in almost no subjects, all cash in most situations. And it wasn't yeah. just us. It was, seemed like that was a common case. Uh, I remember when I grew up with my dad, there was a lot of, you know, subjects, um, when you wrote offers, especially when the market was really soft in the eighties on, on Vancouver Island. Uh, you know, subject to the sale of your own home. Are you starting to see that again? <laughs> Definitely. Uh, a subject to sale offer two years ago was don't bother, don't waste the, the paper that you're writing on. Now it's please bring me a subject to sale, bring, bring me an offer, we'll work on it. Right. Um, we're being very creative with a lot of the offers that are coming across our desk now. Yeah. Uh, you can come and see a home three times before you make a decision versus seeing something on Thursday evening 
having to write an offer, a subject free on Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday. Yeah. Now you're seeing it on Sunday, you're seeing it again next month, and you're seeing it again the week after that. Right. So uh, <laughs> mom and dad can actually come and give some solid advice to their kids and uh, walk them through a, a process of s- a buy and do it carefully. Yeah. So subjects are welcomed now, yeah. which is a, a fresh, fresh, uh, fresh term in a contract. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I often... Uh, notice when you hear you hear real estate data coming out and saying, "Oh, sales are down. This is up. This," is, and and when you drill down into it, and this is, a, I'm going to give you a bit of my criticism over the 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 dial the sort of the, the the push of information coming from the real estate sector, is it always seems to be around the volume of sales, not the pricing. And I, I would assume that most people don't give a shit about the volume. I mean, you would. I mean, I would think most realtors. When you said the first thing you said was slow, yeah. And as as a as a someone who's buying or selling a place, I, I I would assume that I don't care if it's slow. What I care about is whether the prices are going up or going down. Yeah. Uh, because you know I'm only there for one transaction, but this is what you, how you make your living. Exactly. Um. Uh. So, is it true that most of the time when you hear these, is it is it are they talking more about volume? I mean, how do you know when they're when they say real estate's up or real estate's down? Are they talking about volume or are they talking about pricing? <laughs> The media can spin it however they want, I suppose. Okay. But for me, I don't really care, to be honest, if the market goes up or down. Yeah. And I mean price. I make money and I pay for my bills through transactions. Right. So if there's one transaction through a year and the price goes up 100%, I'm still not feeding <laughs> yeah, my family. Not, not feeding your family, yeah. <laughs> so uh, transaction base is obviously very important to somebody in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, prices for the general public is obviously a hell of a lot more important than the number of deals that are transacting on a monthly basis. Yeah. Uh, I think when it comes down to it, it's basically supply and demand. Yeah. Um, if you really pay attention to the stats that are being released in the beginning of a month, giving you an idea of what happened last month, you're getting how many listings came on the market, how many transactions actually happened, and then they'll lastly say, this is what happened when it comes to the price. So listen to that last comment that a journalist is typically going to come up with is what happened to prices. Yeah. Okay. Because that's okay. important to you. Yeah. As yeah. a as a consumer. I mean, I got to think that I, I'm just being a little facetious when I made that comment earlier because I got to think that you know you want to have a certain amount of volume. I mean, if things aren't moving, then it doesn't help anybody. Yeah. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, I'm assuming if you are a seller, you do want to see an active market because you know the the last thing you want to do is have to sit on a property for six months or a year if you have to sell it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, well, look, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, some of these other hot topics in real, in real estate and uh, look forward to carrying on this conversation. Sure. Sounds good. Thanks. Thanks. All right. So here we are back with uh, my good friend, Mike Ramp from Engel and Volkers talking about real estate in Vancouver. Uh, so Mike, uh, let me ask you this. You mentioned about your key markets being downtown, which sounds like it's obviously mostly just condominiums. Yep. Uh, you've got West Side Vancouver, which I would assume is mostly single detached homes. It's a combination. We do Com- everything from condos, townhouses, two houses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess because yeah, Kitsilano and Carisdale, those areas probably have those. Uh, yeah. And yeah. then, and then you got a, quite a good mix in, in East Van. Yeah. Can I buy something for a million bucks in Vancouver today? The answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> what, what can I? What's yeah. what if, if I'm in the condo market? Okay. What what can I get that's uh, that's pretty pretty sexy, pretty neat? We yeah. actually just sold a property in Point Grey, um, under a million dollars, uh, three bedrooms. Beautiful property. You live in it all day long. Really? Uh, gorgeous property. Um, yeah, allow rentals. Um, pets allowed. Wow. Great updates. Newer. Yeah. yeah. And what is yeah. it? You said it sold for below a million. What, like 990. Nine, nine, okay. So basically <laughs> at a million bucks. Yeah. Um, and, and so let's, and what about houses? Can I, could I buy a house? Could I buy some real land with my own backyard in Vancouver for a million bucks today? Would you want to live in it? Yes. It, no. <laughs> uh, the east side of Vancouver, there was a house. There are a couple of houses that made the news because you can actually buy a house under a million dollars. I'm very familiar with them. Yeah. Um, would I want to raise my family in them at the moment? Not in the condition that they are. Okay. Uh, so with, they're teardowns or? No, they just, they need some TLC. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, one of the things that I've also noticed about Vancouver and maybe this, I'm curious to know if this has changed. You know, it, where our, I grew up and my wife grew up in Vancouver and Victoria, people just generally don't tear down homes unless your house is like right on the water or the place is so decrepit. I mean, you would never, you would never buy a house that's like in good condition and it's 20 years old or 30 years old and tear it down. Yeah. 
my observation in Vancouver, like where I live, for example, the house right next to us, it sold for $11.3 million a couple of years ago. You probably know the house. And the owners have put tarp, blue tarping over the roof. Uh, it's, um, it's actually tearing apart now. They've got to put new tarp on there, I should tell them. But <laughs> they get this tarp, they've got tarp over this $11.3 million house. And it's amazing, but I guess the reason, the rationale they have is that why would they replace the roof of this house? Because eventually... Someone's going to tear it down. Right. Yeah. Is, is that still the case today? Like, is, is it still basically, if your house is older than 15, 20 years old and it's, in, and it's got a Vancouver postal code, it's selling for, you know, land value only? It depends. There are new zonings that have come in RS1, you're allowed multifamily now in the sense of a suite downstairs. Uh, you can turn it into a duplex. Uh, whether there's pros and cons to that, we can discuss that at another time. Yeah. Um, so it really depends what zoning, where it is, what condition, and what the end buyer is going to be looking for. So if you're buying it as a project, uh, a lot of the foreign investors are looking for new. They don't want old. They don't want reasonably new. They want new. Uh, Are there still foreign investors after all these taxes have come in? <laughs> Not many. <laughs> <laughs> Not many, that's for sure. Okay. Um, uh, we can get into that later, I'm sure. Uh, so, yeah, it really does depend what what the end user is going to be using it for, and there's so many different scenarios. Okay. So the answer is yes and no. Yeah. No. If if you had a million bucks and you were a first-time home buyer, let's say you're married with your your, your, your kids and you want to get into the market for the first time, in your view today, in this market today, where are you going to get better value? Like now we're talking about a, so maybe let's not talk a million bucks because apparently we can't buy anything for a million. So let's say you got a million and a half to spend. Yep. Can you buy, can you live in something for a million Oh, and definitely. Half? Okay. Yep. So you got a million and a half. Are you better off going towards the direction of a condo or going be better going towards a single detached home? Okay. Um, so when you say a million and a half, that's obviously a deposit, a down payment and a mortgage. So yeah. most like you're all, families, all in, all in yeah. 1.5. Yeah. You can even spend less than that. Okay. Uh, the way that I see Vancouver is you've got an ocean, you've got a mountain range, and you've got a border. Okay. We're not building any more land. So right. what's valuable? More people are moving here. I moved here. I was not born and raised here. You were born in Victoria, and you moved yeah. here. Yeah. Um, I was born in Vancouver, but we're okay. but anyways, yeah, And you yeah. moved, you're now yeah. here raising yeah. your family. Yeah. So the way that I see it is land has to hold its value. Uh, and if okay. everybody decides to leave Vancouver, which I doubt that's going to happen. Um, the value of land is always going to hold. Yeah. So I think the more ratio of land you own, the better. If you own gotcha. a condo, maybe there are 200 units in the building, you own one two hundredth of the land, depending right. on the size of your unit. Then if you get a little bit bigger, you're going to own it, let's say a townhouse or a duplex. Your ratio of the ownership of land increases as you get bigger, so towards a duplex. And then obviously number one prize is going to be land. Yeah, sure. Buying a house. Yeah. So it depends if you can get into a duplex or a bigger townhouse, go for it uh, over a townhouse or a, over a condo. Yeah. But if you can buy a house, get into a house, S stretch yourself a little bit more, have a mortgage yeah. helper downstairs, which is a suite, um, sh throw some tenants down there, and then maybe you can build up some equity in it and have the tenant move out and have a nanny suite downstairs or yeah. have your parents or in-laws, hopefully your parents, not your in-laws, <laughs> <laughs> move in. Um, that's that's another better option. Yeah. Um, if you go to my website, I have a video for helping young families actually get into the real estate market. And it goes into tips like buying something a little bit older, do some work to it, yeah. uh, build up your condo or your investment in real estate. So I started with a small condo. Now I'm in a triplex essentially, okay. and I didn't do it my first jump. You can't get into the real estate market where it's very challenging unless you've got some very wealthy parents or you're doing very well at work yeah. uh, to go buy a brand new property, sure. brand new house or townhouse or duplex. You got to climb up that ladder whether you like it or not. So yeah. it's, it's, it takes time and uh, millennials will unfortunately find this somewhat frustrating, yeah. uh, but it takes time to get into your dream home. Yeah. It really okay. does. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. By the way, you mentioned your website. I should do a little plug for you. What is Thank your you. website address? Vancityliving.com. Vancityliving.com. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let, let's let's talk a little bit about these new taxes. You mentioned earlier we've got a new government. We actually have a new city government, uh, yep. which is probably not too different from the old one. Um, a little more, I guess, 
left wing kind of yep. socialist. They're very focused on affordable housing, that kind of thing. So, uh, and then we've also have this similarly with the sort of uh, my, minority government of these uh, coalition that some people call a coalition between yep. the NDP, NDP and the Green, Green and Liberals. Yep. Yeah. So you've got this. So Gregor Roberts brought uh, Robertson brought in the. Uh, empty homes tax that's been in place for like this is the second or third year now that's been in place yep. and effectively the BC government they call it a speculation tax but effectively it's also an empty homes tax essentially yep. um, and so it seems to me if you're a foreign buyer the government of British Columbia and the city uh, municipal government has basically said if you want to buy a house here it's going to cost you yep. is that a fair comment yeah okay yeah and, and what is it going to cost you? Like if, if I was a wealthy person from, from uh, overseas, mainland China, it seems like a lot of people coming from there, at least historically, and I'm coming here to Canada, you know, there's a, there's a foreign home buyer's tax, right? Yep. What is that? What's that percentage? So now you're 20%. Your property transfer tax as for a foreign national yeah. is 20%. So taken from 15 to 20. So let's do an example. You've, yeah. you've got, let's say you buy a house, $5 million. $5 million bucks. Okay. You're buying a big yeah. investment property in Vancouver. Yeah. You're going to buy a um, $5 million home. You've got 20% tax. And let's say you're not living in it. I'll yeah. summarize all the numbers. You're probably all in writing a check to the government for close to $1.5 million. On year one. On year one. And, and then, then you've on got an vacancy basis? tax if you're not renting it out. No, not renting it out. Yeah, it's going to be a vac vacation home to come to in the summertime. And, and if you, if you, well, parks are my cash to basically, keep, you know. Yep. Yeah. You've got uh, the, now, the new school tax. Right. So it's even higher at 5%. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not good at math, but I can tell you one thing. It's basically one middle finger to all foreign nationals <laughs> that says you're not welcome to buy real estate in Vancouver anymore. So yeah. are there still, in your opinion, are, are there still foreign buyers buying in Vancouver and they're either A, just eating this as a cost of being able to have a little bit of foothold on some real estate in a stable society that, you know, doesn't have you know, runaway inflation or are these people literally just finding a way to loophole the system by buying it through a cousin or a friend or setting up a corporation or... Um, so what, what's your gut feeling on that one? That's a challenging one. Um, we've been very, very lucky. Uh, the clients that we've worked with, um, I've had no sense, zero inkling that any of them are laundering money or doing anything illegal. Yeah. Uh, all of our clients are referrals, part of our sphere, our sphere, sphere, et cetera. Um, so I'm sure there is a lot of it going on. Um, buying it buying a property in someone else's name a relative's name or a friend's name that lives in the country probably happens more than we think mm -hmm. um i personally haven't experienced anything like that in the sense of a buyer yeah uh, we've represented many homes on the west side east side of vancouver that potentially could have gone that way obviously we're kept at arm's length so we don't know what's going on yeah um it's it's really tough to say yeah uh, but i'm sure a lot of it is going on now we had a client that lives in asia um, comes to Vancouver a lot. He found out all of this was coming out, uh, all of these taxes and the new policies are being implemented. And he actually flew out to Vancouver to have lunch with us. And Sherry and I took him out for lunch and we wanted to see, he wanted to ask us what was going on. And we also wanted to ask him what was going on in your head. How, how do you perceive all of this? And it was a very interesting conversation. Basically what he said to us is we love Vancouver. We love Canada. We love how the government looks after its citizens. It's not like where I live, where if I want to retire, all of a sudden my financial portfolio and all my real estate's been ripped from me and I can't retire. So leaving money in Vancouver is an amazing opportunity because I know it's going to be there when I'm done, but his perception is I'm not going to buy a property, leave it vacant and continue the issue of Vancouver and the affordable issue and the availability of homes. Um, and the property that he buys, he does actually rent out right. or a family member is in it or whatever the scenario is. Um, so I liked his perspective and him, like me, love Canada. I love Canada. It's, yeah. it's one of the most amazing countries in the world. Uh, we look after its people, which is amazing. Um, so he's going to continue to invest. And I asked when, and he said, not for a while. I'm going to wait to see what happens. Right. So this is a conversation that I had about a year ago. Because even so, if he rents out his property, okay, so if he rents it out, 
He's not going to have to be, he won't pay the uh, Vancouver municipal empty homes tax. Yep. He won't pay the BC government's new speculation tax, yep. but he's still going to pay 20% foreign home buyers tax just to oh, yeah. bring the money into the country and buy that real estate. And then he's also going to still pay his property taxes, which is now I'm going to include this new education tax. Yeah. So the upfront and annual cost to purchase a place is still very significant. Five million dollars, twenty percent right there alone is a million bucks. So, yeah. And it and if and it's not like the market value went from five million to six million. So he's going to spend. So where you and I would spend five million on that house, and tomorrow if we wanted to sell it, it would sell for maybe five million. Yeah. If this foreign buyer comes in and they they're it's actually going to cost them six so they yeah or be, maybe a bit more and yeah. then and then they're going to have this annual cost so they're going to have to really see the price rally over the next five or ten years yeah you know in my view this this it, my opinion is this this foreign home buyer tax is a bit a bit of a bad decision by the government in fact i think that what they've done is they they should have they should have in my view capped it at a certain level because it the theory is that this is supposed to help, it was supposed to help dampen the pricing of real estate, make housing more affordable. Um, but if you look at certain neighborhoods where houses, even if they drop by 50% in value, would still not be affordable, you're discouraging people from buying in those areas altogether. Yeah. And, and, and at, just like you as a realtor, as the government, they only make money on the foreign home buyers tax and property transfer tax when real estate moves. Exactly. Transactions. Yeah, transactions. So, <laughs> so I got to think that in a, in a funny way, the, the government with their property transfer tax and their foreign home buyer tax should be incentivized in the same way you are to try and move real estate. And if it's too punitive to the point where people don't want to sell it or they don't want to buy it, yep. it it's going to mean less money for the for the government, which means less money for social programs, that kind of thing. Well, the line item for the budget had to get revised from property transfer tax because they were assuming that that would go up. It hasn't. It's gone down. They've earned yeah. less money, revenue, from transfer tax. Right. Since they implemented the increase. Yeah. Amazing. So, yeah, I think there's not been enough thought put into this or they're going to start to have to revise this. Challenges that they have been so adamant on this that for them to now reverse course or reduce these taxes. I think that's going to have to come from another administration, probably from the BC Liberals or some other party in the future. I don't know how they'd ever yep. back up Hopefully out of that. we won't have to wait too long. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with respect to, uh, to, to the price of real estate, where, have you got any kind of interesting story? Like, have you seen anything like really drop in price? Well, well just do some research in West Vancouver. Uh, you're looking at some houses were originally listed in 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 million, and you're seeing a sale price at six, seven, eight million. Really? Uh, I did an evaluation for somebody on the west side of Vancouver looking at original list price of 10, 11, 12 million, and sale price, seven million. Um, wow. Nothing wrong with the house, just found a situation where maybe a seller had bought something and was holding on to too much real estate and really needed to get rid of something. Yeah. Um, there are there are some crazy reported stats. Yeah. I think so. Has uh, the biggest swing downwards been on the highest end of the market? Hundred percent. Okay. Very, very, very much so. Okay. Yeah. And I think this also leads you into an opportunity in the market. You can look at any market and find an opportunity. Yeah. If you're talking to someone that's looking at upsizing, so say you've got a two bedroom condo, you just found out you're having another kid. Yeah. So when you sell your home today, you may lose fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Okay, but now you want to try to get into something where you need three bedrooms, let's say one level, three bedrooms up top, living area downstairs, and maybe you'll find a suite downstairs. So that house that was originally listed at $2 million, now maybe 1.5. So you've lost right on. $50,000 on your on sale, your condo. but you've just earned, earned in inverted yeah. commas, earned $500,000, or let's not say earned, saved yeah. $500,000 on your purchase. Yeah. So if you're ever looking for a time to well, upsize. It, yeah, upgrading, it, I is guess, it. is the market to do it in because 100%. the only people that are really hurting are the ones who need to downgrade because they're, because if, I mean, if you were to look at, even if all real estate equally across the board dropped by a value of 20%, yeah. and you go from a million dollar house to a $2 million house, there you go. even though you're taking a $100,000 hit on the sale, 
you're saving you're 200. Saving 200 in the purchase. Yeah, there yeah, you go. Yeah. yeah. Let, let's talk about some of the, uh, I talked earlier about some of the unknowns or things that are kind of a mystery in the real estate world. There's a lot of, been a lot of criticism over the years over, even when you go into MLS, I mean, it's there's only one site in Canada, as I know, yep. to be able to find uh, listings unless you're working with a realtor. The information you get is pretty limited. Yep. It's real. I mean, it's been upgraded a bit, but it's still a really terrible site in my view. Yep. By contrast, you know, I look in the, ca in the capital markets, like in the public markets, where you're looking at stocks and you can pull all sorts of data on any comp any publicly listed company, not only see their financials, but independent websites that will give you, you know, capital ratios and and price to earnings, all this kind of stuff. And it seems like if you really want any kind of real data, you got to work with a realtor. Um, is that still the case today? They're changing that. Uh -huh. So now even on our website in the next few days, we're going to be able to, you will be able to do research and find a sale price. So what it was listed for and what it sold for. Yeah. And I think that's imperative to the public. Uh, one of the things that drives me nuts about this industry is it's, there's no transparency whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's one of my big frustrations as a consumer. Okay, Mike. So let's figure out how you guys get paid. Sure. Uh, a lot of people, I think, make got the impression that realtors just make a fortune and they don't work that hard. And but I, I know that's not the case. Uh, growing up with a dad who was a realtor, um, so let why don't you, why don't we drill down to the numbers here so people can really understand how a guy like you gets paid and how deals really end up getting done, sure. um, especially in slow markets like this. I'm assuming it it takes a bit more effort to sell something than in a than in a hot market. Yeah, very much um, so. So let's say I, I own a place for two million bucks and I'm going to be a seller. Yeah. Uh, and we, we come to, let's say, I, let's say I actually listed the place for 2.2 and had to drop my price and I finally got a deal done and it's at 2 million bucks. Um, what's the typical commission on that going to be? Sure. Well, let, let's back it up. Uh, somebody said to me the other day, w when you get your real estate license, the real estate board's handing out BMW keys. <laughs> it's not the case. <laughs> it's not a fact. <laughs> um, so if you look at it, a house around $2 million, uh, I'm representing the seller. Uh, the commission total paid by the seller is around $50,000. Okay. Okay. There's obviously a range in there. Uh, on average, you're looking around 50. Half of that goes to the buyer's agent. So it's about two and a half percent. Roughly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. On so, the total. Correct. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's a scale, but that's essentially it. Yeah. $25,000 will go to the buyer's agent. So the realtor okay. that brings the buyer to the table. Uh, us bringing a buyer to you, is no longer, you're not allowed to do that. You can't double end a property. So oh, you can't do that anymore. No, it's banned. Oh. <clears throat> so half of it, you get Even to work with. Even with proper disclosure. Well, you can do a no agency, but it gets really complicated. Oh, we well, don't. Well. Um, it's, it's not a fan. We haven't been a fan of it since day one. Right. So $25,000 we got to pay with. Okay. We've got a brokerage that we work with that takes, uh, let's say $1,000 a month we need to pay towards. Okay. We've got to pay our fee, which is typically a commission split. It's a sliding scale to our brokerage as well. Let's yeah. say that's What's 10%. the industry standard there? 10? 10. 10, 10%. 10, 10%. 10 percent. Some, uh, some offices are 50. Of the 50 or of the 25? Of our portion, okay. of the 25. All right, yeah. so so you got right away 25, so you got $1,000 that month for your rent. Yep. You got 2,500 bucks in a brokerage fee. Yep. So 3500 bucks yep. off the 25,000 already. Off the top. Yeah. Then we've got uh our marketing manager. So like you got to pay to put it online. Yeah. You got to do the ad on Craigslist to um Instagram, Facebook. Yeah. That's probably Does that cost money? Oh, very much so. Uh -huh. Yeah, we're up to probably 3 to 500 dollars for that. Okay. So let's add another five hundred dollars for there. Yeah, sort of four grand now. Yep. Then we've got a ad campaign. So we send out just listed to okay. about uh, several thousands of people, which is gonna cost between two to three thousand dollars. Let's take let's say two thousand dollars. So we're at Six. Those are going to other realtors. No, that's to the public mm -hmm. houses around the neighborhood. So you've probably got several at home. Okay. Um, yeah. Just listed. This home just hit the market. Come and yeah. have a look. We're open house on the weekend, yada, yada, yada. But if you can't double list anymore, sorry, double, double, double end. If you can't double end anymore, how does that help you? Because what if somebody came in long into your, actually, I, what if someone came, the way Crystal and I got you as a realtor, we showed up at one of your open houses. Yes. Now, of course, we didn't buy the house we came to see. Yeah. Uh, it took you three years, and I think you showed us like 100 <laughs> houses. <laughs> um, but if we'd come in and wanted to buy that house from you and we didn't have a realtor, wh yeah. what do you have to do there? You refer that person out or we say, go find another realtor. My, yeah. I have a relationship with my seller. Yeah. You're my principal client, um, and that's not wavering. 
Can you yeah. can you at least refer them to somebody you know so yeah. that they can at least get the and then they hopefully will send you business back your way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've All got right. relationships, and what I would do is send it to someone I know that's really competent. Yeah. Will look after you. Yeah. Not. Um, yeah. Exactly. So yeah. there's no conflict of interest there, which I really yeah. like. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're, so we're at, up to like 4,000 bucks. I think we're at six with the mail drop. Oh, with the mail so drop. So yeah. now we've advertised your home yeah. just to other neighborhoods. So typically the way that I see it is um, the house that I live in or the play, home that I live in, uh, I've got lots of friends come over and they're like, man, you got to let me know when your neighbor comes on the market. So there's a reason why we send out that mail drop. So that we notify our friends and family, hey man, our next door neighbor is coming on the market or that beautiful house that you noticed, they're, they're for sale. So yeah. we let the, the public know that your home is coming on the market. Yeah. And that we're doing an open house, come by and visit. Yeah. Then we do... Um, what about like those fancy videos you see? Is that very common or... Yeah, so that's coming. The last video we did cost me $8,000. Wow. Uh, it's and not cheap. It's drone. What, kind of, it's, what, what was the list price of that house roughly that was seven so seven. six and a half yeah yeah so it's the higher end properties obviously yeah. the commission is larger so we spend more money spend on the marketing more. but still so there's no guarantees here oh no <laughs> no have yeah. you ever had any houses where you've put a lot of time and effort and money and you didn't get a sale hundreds oh really oh yeah it happens all the time so that's that's sunk cost right there Yeah, that's gone you know yeah oh yeah so we we hire professional photographers uh shoots costing up to about eight hundred dollars that's just for the photographer wow then you got a floor plan and yeah. you got a virtual tour. Um, oh, yeah, those floor plans are expensive too, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they're 10 cents a square foot and they yeah. go up. So yeah. add, like, let's put 1500 to three grand. I would probably spend $3,000 on the marketing. Yeah. Then we've got feature sheets. They're a dollar a piece. Wow. Uh, they're all cardboard, high end, glossy stock. Um, no, I, I love my wife and I love that show, Million Dollar Listing LA. Yeah. And you see all these f crazy parties they host. Do you, does that stuff ever happen here in Vancouver? And do you ever spend that kind of money on? Very much so. We really? had uh, a house on Angus Drive where we had luxury cars. We had professional dancers. We had musicians. We had champagne. We had everything. And, and, like, I, I, like, I love marketing, right? And I think yep. I'm a sales guy myself. But does that really work? Or is that just an excuse to have a really fun time and write it off as an expense? Both. <laughs> uh it's nice to see nice cars it's nice to yeah. <laughs> to bring people into your home it's i appreciate your honesty by the <laughs> way man. that's awesome um <laughs> uh, look we, our goal is to market a property so that if there are 10 people in the world that are going to potentially buy this this home they need to find out about it yeah. And we have a marketing manager on staff so that those 10 people will see us online, see it in person, hear about it through a flyer. And when they see it, they're like, holy smokes, that place looks good. Yeah. I need to go and have a look at it. Yeah. So in order to get that perception of the property before they've even had a look at it, cost me money. Yeah. A lot of money. Yeah. So we've, let's say, I haven't, we've lost track. I'm sure somebody's been counting, but we're probably at $15,000 to market a home. Yeah, amazing. Let's, let's be conservative and say it's 12. Right. Okay, so we're $12,000 $12, to market a home. Yeah. You haven't taken account into my hours yeah. that I put into this home. So I met the seller maybe five years ago. Right I've on. taken them out for lunch. Yeah. I've taken them out for dinners. I visited their kid's birthday. Yeah. I, don't get me wrong. I enjoy that part of my yeah. job. But it's but it's part of your job that you don't get paid for. Exactly. You're not you're not, you're not showing up and getting a, a paycheck and a pension for that. I'm not I'm not at home having dinner with my family. Yeah. I'm visiting you at your office or at one of your networking events yeah. or I'm not with my family yeah. on in my evenings or on the weekends so yeah. that I can cultivate and create these amazing relationships. So we haven't even taken that into account. Yeah. So now yeah, it's, it's a huge sacrifice. I mean, growing up as a, you know, being again, growing up with a dad who was a realtor for 25 years. I mean, there's many, many times where we didn't have, dad wasn't there for dinner, you know, or he, oh, yeah. or he had to jump out and, you know, on a Sunday evening when we were playing a board game, because he's got to go see somebody last minute. He's yeah. calling, you know, our, our deals falling apart or deals coming and you together gotta go and, and bring uh, it back together. And, yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Wow. So there's, there's that sacrifice as well. Yeah. Um, I don't have weekends with my family or my yeah. evenings. Yeah. Um, but I love the people that I work with. So it's, it's, it makes, yeah. but it, you can, it's worth it. Listen, you can make good money too though, right? You can, uh, but it, just to get back to the cost. So yeah. you've, you're at roughly half of that, let's say 30% yeah. has gone to expenses. Yeah. Now you've got to pay the tax man. Right. So yeah. now you pay 40% taxes. How much are you left? You've got $8,000 yeah. um, left to put in your back pocket. 
Yeah. So Medallion, the real estate board of Greater Vancouver, has created a system. They calculate the top ten percent of realtors. What is Medallion? Medallion is the top ten percent of realtors. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Based on this is an independent study or something. Yeah. So the real estate board is they run MLS. Okay. And they've calculated how many sales have been done by every agent, and they can categorize. This is in dollars or in units? No, transactions. Oh, okay. So last year, two thousand and eighteen, in order to make it into the top ten percent of realtors, you had to sell fourteen homes. 14 properties. And it doesn't matter, does it matter if, you, if it's a buyer or a seller? Doesn't matter, as, buyer as or long, seller. As long and as it you, can be you can... 500 or 500 million, doesn't matter. Okay. So the average home, this is greater Vancouver, 14 homes. The average sale price is not $2 million. It's closer to one. Wow. So let's cut that commission in half, yeah. all your expenses. So you're looking at roughly two to $3,000 a transaction right gets on. to put in your back pocket. So top 10 realtor, top 10%, I mean, to get there, you, you might only be making 150 grand a year. That's revenue. And then you've got all your costs coming off. Right. So if, as I said, your, your average sale is a million dollars. If you're walking away with $3,000 and you're doing 14 transactions, do the math. You're not driving a BMW <laughs> and you're in medallion. So what or about you are, but you're le- barely making your lease payments. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe you did really well a year before. Yeah. So that that's 90% of the realtors are doing four, less than 14 deals wow. the whole of last that's year. That's amazing. So, I mean, it sounds amazing. What, like, by contrast, what, to get to Medallion, when was the market probably its hottest? Like 2000? 2016, 2017. So only two, only three years ago. Yeah. So in 2016, if you wanted to make Medallion, how many, how many sales? Probably 30. Wow, so it's dropped by more. A lot. Time. Yeah. So the volume has dropped considerably yeah. of sales. The volume of sales has dropped. Volume sales, yeah. 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 So, so, yes, can you make a lot of money in real estate? Yes, but you have to be very good. You yeah. have to be honest. Well, unfortunately, not all realtors are honest, but um, you, you all, have not. Neither are all podcasters. <laughs> 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 um, real estate. You can make a lot of money, but you need to be smart. You need to work hard. Uh, you need to work a lot. Uh, a 40 hour work week, if that's what you desire, yeah. do not be a realtor. No. It's not going to happen. Are yeah. you seeing a lot of people m- dropping out? As, like, uh, is there <laughs> stats on real estate licenses? Yes, it used to be on our homepage of uh, the MLS program where we'd sign in. It was 14,600, and now it's not on there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's a sign. That's a sign that they're, uh, they may be dropping off like flies, but. Um, I'm not too sure what that count is. I'm sure we will find out soon. Yeah. Yeah. Now going back to those expenses, one of the things I've always been interested about is, is staging. Yes. Uh, When do you decide to stage a place and who pays for that? And what does it cost? I would stage almost every home we sell, whether it's a partial stage or a full stage. Okay. Uh, Whether you like it or not, uh, we live in a home and it's not, it's designed for us to live in. Yeah. Uh, it's not designed for us to show. Like you go into a show suite for a pre-construction. Like you walk in there and everyone's like, man, I want to live here. Like I can oh, yeah. see it's myself like a beer sitting. Commercial. Exactly. I yeah. can see myself sitting on that couch, <laughs> de-stressing with a beer or a glass of wine at the exactly. end of the day yeah. and watching a TV on that wall. The kids are asleep. And, yeah, you know, it's perfect, right? It's, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're selling the dream. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So staging uh, it can cost a few hundred dollars all the way. The biggest staging job we did cost about fifteen to seventeen thousand dollars. Wow! And that was a fifteen thousand square foot house, top of the line furniture. And that's just. Uh, now, is there a monthly cost to that, or is yeah? That so that's a month. That's a m- that's per month for the first month, and then typically the second month and third it, month will be about fifty percent. Okay. Yeah. So the the monthly cost afterwards. And of does course, if drop. real estate's not moving, it can it be take, expensive. It can be expensive because I mean yeah. how. What's a, what, there's a stat about uh, like the average inventory or something like that, right? What is that stat that you guys use? It talks about how long a typical house sits listed before it sells. Yeah, them. average days on market. Yeah, what is that yeah. number today? Uh, that varies, depends oh. on what area, what market, condos. Well, let's like. talk about your market. So let's talk about the three markets. So let's talk about the downtown condo market. Yep. The high end west side Vancouver market and you're kind of like still somewhat affordable east Vancouver. Sure. Yeah. So let's let's start. We've got some very expensive listings. Uh, very high. Uh, what's the price point is very high. Yeah. For some of our listings, and we've got one listing that's been on the market for over a year. Okay. We're a year and a half. Yeah. Um, so that's not far fetched. Uh, you're looking at something, let's say $3 million. If it sells within three months, you've done well. Really? You're looking at a one bedroom condo. It should sell if you're priced right in two weeks. 
Okay. So it really depends on the range. Yeah. Um, that also gets into the higher luxury market. There's a lot less buyers. Yeah. There are a lot more buyers in the one bedroom condo downtown. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So detached market downtown, uh, if you're on the east side, you're trying to sell a house on the east side, you're looking, if you're priced well, a month. Yeah. Wow. Condos, townhouses, and kits, you're two weeks. Okay. If you're priced well and it's marketed properly. Yeah. Uh, big house on the west side, you're, brace yourself, like settle in. Really? <laughs> yeah. Six, 60 days, you've done well. Um, if you price it really well and you're giving it away, it will sell in a week. Yeah. Um, but if you, you want to price it well and market it correctly, you're three months. Wow. Yeah. Don't yeah. be surprised if it takes longer. And going back to that staging, who pays for that cost? The seller. The seller pays yeah. for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, wow. so, so going back to that kind of sort of wrapping up the, the income side of things. So, uh, uh, we talked about the seller side. Now, I guess all those other costs that you referenced, if you're representing as the buyer, that's kind of to your, you don't have to cover those costs, right? No, you don't have any expenses other than your office expenses. So, so hopefully some of your business comes from buyers and that helps offset the, the cost the cost. of sellers. Yeah. 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 That you often hear about it's a buyer's market, it's a seller's market. What, what does that mean and what market are we in right now? So <laughs> if you see uh, three months where the same trend is going on, so you see more inventory coming on the market and less sales, that means buyers have a lot more options because okay. they've got less competition and they've got more inventory coming on the market. Yeah. So you have three months running in a row where you've got 12% sales to listing, uh, sale to active yeah. ratio, um, you'll see the market starting to drop. So that's a buyer's market. A yeah. stable is gonna be roughly 12 to 20% is gonna be a balanced market. So the prices are gonna stay quite consistent. Okay. Once you're over 20%, you're definitely in a buyer's market. So that's what we were very familiar with, 2014, 15, 16, 17. Yeah. Um, just as fast as a property comes on the market, it sells. What's the fastest you've ever sold a place? Zero minutes. R really? Yeah. Basically, a seller came to us and said, listen, I've got a, I want to sell this house. I'm like, well, I know someone that wants to buy this house and contacted that person's <laughs> agent. And by the end of the phone call, it was done. <laughs> no, st no staging needed in that one. Not at all. <laughs> What's the longest you've taken to sell a place? Uh, is that a buyer or a seller? Uh, both. <laughs> Loaded question. Andrew, you're probably my longest client I've ever worked with. <laughs> you're, uh, a patient, you're a patient man. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed every minute. Um, seller, honestly, infinity. Well, if that was possible. Um, we've worked with many sellers where it didn't come together. Yeah. So it never came to a close. Right. Um, our average, we're very, we keep track of all those statistics. We follow what the list price to sale price ratio is. Um, our With our marketing experience and with our marketing team, we're getting more money for our clients yeah. than the average agent is in really? our area, which yeah. is phenomenal. We're really yeah. proud of that. What do, you, what, what do you attribute that to? Um, I think a lot of our marketing and our sales technique, yeah. um, just being persistent, being a yes team. If somebody wants to see a property, we make damn sure they can see it. Yeah. Uh, you can't buy a property without seeing it. So we want to make sure that everyone's on the same page, getting someone in our marketing, our brochures, our yeah. f photography videos, our also our reach for how and where we market our homes yeah. uh, is exceptional. We sold a property on Point Grey Road and the buyer was not in Canada, stu did a walkthrough on the virtual um, platform really? uh, was able to see what it was like to open a door to go see in the kitchen what it was like uh, turn around see a different perspective and he bought it sight and scene wow yeah so that that sort of marketing really does make a difference yeah yeah are there any uh are any sort of uh, uh killer apps or, or technology that's coming that's going to disrupt the real estate market in your view VR, I think, is going to have a very big impact, yeah. um, especially when it comes in the pre-sale market. Okay. Um, now you're able to walk into a sales center, uh, put on the virtual goggles, and actually walk into the kitchen and open a drawer. 
Wow. Close a draw. Uh, turn on the hood fan, open the fridge, flush a toilet, grab a drink out off the shelf. The, the technology is absolutely incredible. So now the developer doesn't need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop a, a show suite. Yeah. Now it's one program. And the best thing is, if you want to look at, a let's say, an 05 plan on the 37th floor, you can go up to the 37th floor and see what the view's like. Yeah, You can see what the parking store is going to look like. You can see what storage is going to be like. It's not like you're buying a piece of paper anymore with a floor plan and uh, a print of the display suite, which is an 01 plan. You're actually looking at what an 05 plan actually looks like. So yeah. I think the technology has got a little ways to go, but we're very close. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. There's been a, a lot of, you know, thinking back to the beginning of our ch conversation, we talked about the price of real estate in different areas that you concentrate on. And I keep thinking about that corridor of Canby, and I think it's at King Edward, where there's a SkyTrain station. Yep. And there used to be all these just very old houses uh, along Canby, and they're, not, they're all gone now. They have these assembly lots. You yep. always see that realtor, I forget her name, but she's always got this assembly lot advertisement going on. Mm -hmm. And I got to imagine those people must have done very well Oh yeah. Right. We had a client on King Ed just off Camby uh -huh. and we helped them out for many, many years. And when it came to the sale of their house, they asked us just out of curiosity, what would this house be worth without the land assembly zoning or with the increase in density zoning? And we gave them a value of conservative value around 1.2. What'd they sell it for? Four and a half. Incredible. Yeah. So is there any opportunity, and maybe we shouldn't be asking this online because I'm going to jump, toward, jump on it, but is there, is there other assembly lot opportunities? I mean, is there arbitrage opportunities like that in real estate, do you think? Or is it pretty, there's just so many players in the market that it's, it's pretty hard to get into that kind of there's thing? There's a lot of competition. My, yeah. my rule of thumb is in, in real estate. Yeah. If it's too good to be true, generally, yeah. it's too good to be true. Yeah. Uh, there's always like something you need to look into. Land assembly, uh, long plays, I think there are definitely some areas where you can forecast what the city's going to be doing with travel plans and uh, what are they going to do with taking viaducts down? Okay. Where is the main traffic going to be flowing through? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's some opportunities out there, but it's don't, don't do this as a real estate flip. This is long play. You're speculating yeah. and speculation. Got to be careful. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Now there's a the the provincial government and the um, and TransLink and the municipal government. They're all working towards this. I don't know. If, I don't know where we're at with this uh, uh, public transit uh, line that's supposed to go from downtown out to UBC. Um, do you know what what are they, what are they calling it? Canada Line Number Two or something like that? I don't know what even. What I'm not too call. sure what they've coined the name yet. But but there, there's something coming along those lines, right? Has it oh, been yeah. decided yet? They're trying to figure out who's going to be paying from Arbutus out to UBC. I'm paying attention to this because I live close to Arbutus and Broadway. Okay. Um, so they've. It's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when. Okay. Uh, the SkyTrain will come out to Broadway and Arbutus. Yeah. But if you're going to come that far, you got to run it all the way to UBC. Yeah. Don't do sense. it. Yeah, sure. Don't do a half job of it. It's going to be underground, I think. Right? They're, they're doing this cut and something, or they're going to cut into the they ground. Get, it's expensive to go under. Uh -huh. uh, you saw what happened at, in uh, Canby and yeah. um, just along Broadway, above and below. Yeah. Um, not too sure what's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Once that comes along and it's done. Yep. What does that do to your real estate value? Does it make it go up or make it go down? Or is it indifferent? In my opinion, it depends where you are to the station. Okay. If you're right on the station, in my opinion, I think values will drop because you've got now a lot more density coming in and out. But if you're one block away, two blocks away, three blocks away, now your big selling feature, your first line on the feature sheet when you go to sell it is three blocks from the SkyTrain. Right. It's super convenient to get downtown. Yeah. But you're not going to put that on your feature sheet. Looks at the SkyTrain station. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it really depends. So as you go a little bit further out, diminishing, but uh, it will increase your value as you, yeah. as you get closer. So I'm really excited about it. I hope yeah. it gets passed. Yeah, yeah, neat. Yeah. Um, let's uh, finish off talking a bit more about the affordability issue in Vancouver again. I'm, I don't know if you have an opinion on this or not, but I'm just curious to, it's not been long since the uh, city has put in this empty homes tax and the provincial government's put these new taxes in with an effort to try and, you know, create more affordable housing, housing by, I guess, reverting some of the revenue from these uh, 
from this taxation into s social housing or something like that. I don't, I don't I actually really followed it, as you can tell from my question. <laughs> um, but in your view, is there really anything being done? Like, is are people actually, be able, is there more affordability in Vancouver today than there was two years ago? And do you think it is going to become an affordable city again in, in, in the near future? We live in one of the best cities in the world. Uh -huh. It's safe. Our level of education is recognized all over the world. Um, it's beautiful. We've got mountains. We can go skiing, whether it's Whistler, Cypress, Seymour, uh, from 20 minutes to two hours. Uh, Vancouver has a lot to offer. Whether you like it or not, it's going to be expensive. Okay. Um, the government's MO is to make real estate more affordable and have more real estate available to us. I think the vacancy tax, I don't actually mind it. Mm -hmm. I don't like paying taxes. I already pay enough taxes as it is. Yeah. But vacancy tax helped stimulate availability for properties for people to rent. Right on. I like that. I like the fact that a lot of our clients that were holding or a lot of people that we know had properties that were vacant were now deciding to rent them out. Yeah. Um, what I don't like is the mentality, Vancouverites, and I, I will struggle with this as well. I'm a location snob. Okay. If I'm in Kits and my friends say, hey, let's go for a drink downtown, I'm like, no, you gotta come to Kits. I'm not crossing <laughs> a bridge. When, and that would only take me 10 minutes to, to travel. Yeah. And I've got friends that live in New York that travel an hour to get to work. And they're okay with that. That's just the norm. The yeah. executives, the CEOs, they don't live downtown. They live out with a house, with a yard, and they commute into work. Yeah. Vancouverites don't like to commute. Yeah. So I think if someone says, I hate Vancouver real estate prices, it's so unaffordable, this is ridiculous. Where are you shopping? Are you trying to shop downtown for a three bedroom condo that's 2000 square feet? Well, suck it up. It's going to cost you $6 million. <laughs> right. Or go buy a 2,000 square foot property in Burnaby, which yeah. is going to be half the price. Yeah. Or in Langley, if you really want to take a bigger commute and yeah. you can buy a mansion for $2 million. Yeah. So I think we need to get over what's going on. Whether yeah. you like it or not, Vancouver is not going to be more affordable. Yeah. You will have more options, but you will have to pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my family moved here. We gave up and we sacrificed a lot to move yeah. here. We are all entrepreneurs. My sister's a teacher. My dad owns his own business. My mom works with me. Yeah. Uh, we made a go of it and it took hard work. It took not a lot of days off and we made a go of it and we made a solid go of it. We've yeah. been here for 20 plus years and we're loving it. Yeah, great. Um, and we work really hard. And I think you look at a lot of the other immigrants that are coming here, they're adding, adding to the community. They're... Um, paying taxes, they're donating, uh, they're learning to speak English. Yeah. Uh, immigrants like that, I love seeing that. I, yeah. I love seeing people come in and moving into Vancouver and buying real estate. You deserve to be here. Like, thanks for welcoming us here. I'm really grateful to be a Canadian. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we're glad to have you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and I appreciate, I'll say it one more time because I know I probably was one of your longest. I was that guy who hated to commute. <laughs> so I didn't, I, it took me forever to get me out of downtown, but I'm glad yeah. you did it. And uh, I'm glad that you've done, had done so well with your business. And Thank you very much. For you and Sean. Mike, thanks for having us on the show. We're hopefully we can have you back. And <laughs> hopefully next it. time I ask you how the real estate market, you'll be able to say it's moving fast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Andrew. Thanks, Mike. Cheers. Yeah. Pleasure.